Frank, just to start, uh, um, it, it's possible to argue that this book is a deeply depressing, nihilistic book that really shows someone suffering, in, in a, someone in a very dark place from which there's no release, that the only release is death, and death itself doesn't even seem to come as a sort of release. But I want to think of another way of looking at the book, which is about the idea of presenting a self in fiction, presenting a woman who has emerged from a sort of grey world into some space that has light, where she herself can become someone. And part of the reason why the book, in a way, is so dark is because she herself such a present figure, so so absolutely there in the book. I just want to just want to quote from a moment in the book where we see her uh, actually coming into herself, becoming a sort of person in the book in a way that no one else in the book manages. And um, she's she, she's a nurse in London. She was already this is a quote. She was already reading, getting books out of the little public library beside Algate East Station, beginning to see her life in its passage it end and never repeat itself, and she felt it unique and all the days precious. If she lived the life other people lived, looked on at the way they looked, she'd have no life of her own. She did not want an insured imitation of other people's lives anymore. She wanted her own, and with the wild greed of youth. Safe examples that had gone before were no use, her mother and father and the nurses about her. She could break her way out of the whole set of the impossible became turned by fierce desire into the possible. The whole world beginning again, as it always has to do, when a single human being discovers his or her uniqueness, everything becoming strange and vital and wondrous, in this the only moment of real innocence, when after having slept forever in the habits of other lives, suddenly one morning, the first morning of the world, she had woken up to herself. And it seems to me that, that, that that, that image created there of a, of a sort of awakening and, and, and of light is something we don't often associate with McGahan, and in which case we might miss the point of what he's really talking about, which, which is a sort of idea of what autonomy is, or what grace is, or what light is. Mm. Did, 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 yeah, I mean, I think the book is about um, coming to consciousness, and McGahan believed that not all of us come to consciousness. In fact, he believed that only a minority of us come to consciousness in our lives. And the book is full of unconscious people. Um, Gard Mullins, for instance, who passes the time by listening to football on the radio, reading the newspaper. He takes comfort in, in habit. And the book is full of habit and ritual and the hiding from the more painful lessons that life teaches us behind things like, you know, listening to the, the football at night. Um, I was thinking as you were talking there, Colm, about uh, something that Yeats says, and Yeats was the writer whom McGarren most admired. Yeats says that uh, we cannot begin to live until we have conceived of life as tragedy. Uh, and that, that's what I think Elizabeth Regan sees um, she sees fully, she takes fully on board her own mortality. And that's painful. It's painful for any of us, I think, to, to fully accept that. And it, 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 it is, the, the novel is unrelentingly, uh, it, it won't let us off the hook. It forces us to look at that uh, truth. Um, I remember, I've read this book many times, but I, I picked it up about 20 years ago on a flight from Belfast to uh, Liverpool, because I, I wanted to teach it. And I, ha I had to stop reading it, uh, because I was, I was too upset. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. Uh, and, you know, when I was asked to, to come here and, and think about this, the novel again, I went back to read it again. And it's even better than I remembered. Um, I don't see it as bleak and dark. Sad things happen in it. But Elizabeth Regan becomes fully human. Um, she's come to consciousness in London when she's nursing there uh, during the war uh, because of a love affair that she has with a doctor, Halliday, who gets her to read for the first time. 
And I think it's, it's interesting that we're here talking about reading and what reading can do for your life. Reading has made Elizabeth Regan into the person that she is. This very, in, very bright, uh, you know, she's, she's by, far the most, by far the most interesting character in the book. Um, you know, Regan, her, her husband, who she loves, but who's very difficult, he hasn't come to consciousness. And he's not going to come to consciousness. And that's a failure. You know, and, and for us to live our lives fully, McGarren would argue, and I think he does, does this again and again right throughout all of his novels, consciousness, and the coming to consciousness, is, is the key moment in, in any human life, and not all of us do. Could you give us some idea of the circumstances under which this book was written? So, um, he, John had begun writing in, in the mid-1950s um, after he... Maybe a little bit earlier, he had studied to be a primary school teacher in St. Pat's in Condra. And he'd been writing poetry for the most part for the first few years, none of which was ever published. Um, then he wrote a novel which is called The End or the Beginning of Love, which he never published. He did send an extract of that novel to a literary magazine in London called X, a quarterly review. Um, he was lucky in the way that, that happened, in that he had met a man in a dance hall in, in, on O'Connell Street called Tony Swift. And he'd become very friendly with him and his brothers, a man called Jimmy Swift and Paddy Swift. Paddy was a painter, uh, an artist, and he was co-editor of this magazine in London, X, which was as interested in the visual arts as it was in literature. It was a, a very important early promoter, for instance, of Francis Bacon. And, Jimmy urged John to send some work to Paddy in London, and Paddy liked it. And he published an extract from the novel, The End of the Beginning of Love, in X. Um, Charles Monteith, the very powerful editor at Faber, saw this extract, wrote to John, and said, have you got anything more like this? And John wrote to him and said, this is part of a novel that I've lost faith in, but I have another novel that maybe you'd like to see. And that was the barracks. Um, so John, th there were other uh, publishers interested in the end or the beginning of love. And that, that novel still exists in the archive in, in NUI Galway, if you want to go and read it. You can see why John decided not to publish it. It's, it's raw. It's, it, it's, it's Prentice work. It's nowhere near as finished as, as the barracks. And that's one of the really remarkable things about the barracks, to think that this is a novel written by a man in his mid-20s a, for a debut novel. It's so accomplished, it's really remarkable. But he, he'd already written another novel that he just thought this, this other novel just isn't good enough. And it, it's taken him several years to write. To have the courage to do that, I think, is something. Um, so it, that's how the novel came about. And it, you know, he, he, he was published by Faber. It was, for the most part, critically acclaimed. And it was the start of a, a, a lifelong relationship with Faber. How was it reviewed? It was reviewed, for the most part, favorably. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so uh, Anthony Burgess, who was one of the major English novelists of the period, The Clockwork Orange and so on, he reviewed us for The Observer. And he, he liked it very much. And he said, it has caught so well the peculiar hopelessness of contemporary Ireland. Um, it was reviewed by Kate O'Brien in the Irish University Review. She said, it's difficult to find words exact enough to express my admiration of this subtle, close-woven, tender, true, poetic work. And in the Sunday Times, it was described as a novel of mesmeric power and beauty, with a wholly, and this is interesting, with a wholly Irish absence of despair. Who wrote that review? A man called Michael Ratcliffe. Right. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, got a, it got a bad time in Cork. Uh, the, 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 Cork, the Cork Examiner had this to say, a section of this book won the AE Memorial Award for 1962, the first work of fiction so honoured. One feels that it must have been the first section, because in the middle of his novel, Mr. McGahern allows one of his central characters to think back on her life as a nurse in London and the relationship she had with a young doctor. Up to that point in the novel, the story is down to earth. But at that point, the earth changes to mud. And Mr. McGahern sullies his book with expressions which a London jury in a famous trial found acceptable, 
but which a great number of others most certainly do not. They're referring to the Lady Chatterley trial of 1960. It's a pity that Mr. McGarren so sullies and cheapens his work for a shock effect. We hope you will realize that good writing carries its own conviction. It does not need the cheapening effect of the language of the gutter. <laughs> um, I was asking you who wrote that review because I remember McGarren telling me, maybe it was the next novel, The Dark, but it was a man called Julian Jeb. And uh, was it the dark or the bark? It was the dark. Jeb, right. Jeb reviewed the bar, the the dark. Yes. Yeah. McGarren was in Barcelona, and he was just walking along, and he saw the foreign newspapers, and he just decided to buy a Sunday Times, and just just to, you know, just to get the news. And as he went through it, he said, "Oh my God, there's a review of my book," and the review was glowing review by someone who later became a friend of his. Yes. But he yeah. described that moment of being in a foreign city. The last thing he expected was to find this review. Um, really, if you read all the work, you realise that some of the same tropes come back again and again. I mean, often there's the father figure, he's there in Amongst Women, he's there in short stories like Gold Watch. Um, often there's a son who went away, or there's a whole business of London as a sort of place that refines the spirit in various ways, or people can find things in themselves that, that, that they didn't find at home. Often the same trees, often the same shadows, often the same names, and um, it, 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 it leads me to ask you, what would it have been like to have been his father, his stepmother? What would it have been like to be his siblings? I mean, was, how did they, you know, you can just imagine if your son, hu husband, brother, wrote a novel in which the entire interior of your life was in some way or other described, and some of it changed, of course, it's fiction, mm -hmm. but some of it not. Yeah. How, how did the family deal with that? Very badly. Uh, the father, especially. His sisters, I think, were always very supportive of him. Um, and he, had, he had a younger brother also who had very little to say, Frankie, who was living in London. Um, his father, the sergeant, Sergeant Frank McGarren, um, when the book was published, he drove to Dublin to confront John in his flat on the Hoth Road in Clontarf. Uh, and he brought a priest with him. Um, and he described the book as an immoral disgrace. And he banned John from returning to, the, to his home for Easter. Uh, the, book, the book was published in February. So the father, uh, <laughs> I suppose not surprisingly, he hated the book. It's a, it's a book which describes you know, this difficult, Although, you know, in, in some ways, it's interesting how much Elizabeth still loves him. You know, he, I mean, the father figure in the dark is a much, much darker figure than the father figure in, in the barracks. And John was fascinated by his father and um, always sought to try to understand him. I think, in a way, John's first book and his last books are attempts to understand his father, the barracks and memoir. Uh, his father was a very... Uh, clever, uh, interesting, but thwarted character. Um, and uh, he, he, he caused an absolute rumpus. Um, John writes to Charles Monteith about what happens. Uh, Charles Monteith is, is, is the editor at Faber. He's the same editor that published James Heaney. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was very, um, very powerful yeah, figure. Yeah. An Irishman himself from Lisburn. Uh, he had been a brilliant student at Oxford. He had served in the Second World War in Burma, risen to the rank of major. He, he, he appears in That They Might Face the Rising Sun mm -hmm. uh, as the editor from England. That's so right. we sort of get to know him yeah. in that book. Sorry, yeah. interrupt. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, he, he writes to Monteith after the barracks is published. He says, there was frightful shindy at home. I think I mentioned how I was visited here. Then my abused sisters were summoned from the East and West for conference. My brother, who is in London again, and has a pretty wild career behind him, is considered for years in worse light than me, so was not brought into the presence for fear of sacrilege. And I was formally expelled from my home and poor inheritance. I got a note, and I have this note on my desk in, in Liverpool. The father writes to him. It's his only written reaction to the book. It's a very strange, short letter. He says, Dear Sean, the blinds are drawn, the map lit and an ex-sergeant of police prefers to ponder in the dark until the lamp shows light, or at least flickers, and the rest is silence. <laughs>
That's a pretty good letter. <laughs> it is. I mean, but succinct this, at least. It, yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um, the, the 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 barracks had had a good start because uh, Monteith again had persuaded John to enter a section of it for a literary award in Ireland the year before '62 um, called the A.E. Memorial Award, uh, which had been won by people like Patrick Kavanagh in the past. Um, uh, it was for writers under the age of 35, and no fiction writer had ever won it before. So John enters a section of the barracks, and it wins the prize in um, February 1962, and it gets some newspaper coverage. And uh, the father, the sergeant, writes to John about this. The sergeant had remarried at this point to a woman called Agnes, who was John's stepmother. And the other person mentioned here, Placid, Brother Placid was the headmaster of John's secondary school in Carrick and Shannon. But this is typical of the kind of letter the sergeant writes, the kind of really cruel kind of pressure you can see he's putting on John here. Agnes insists that the paper you left at Christmas, so he'd given her a gift of notepaper, should be used in writing to you. Evidently, it was satisfactory and appreciated. All last week, you were the topic in Coot Hall, but I think they would prefer if you were born in the parish or shown to have some connection with it. Mrs. Henry saw your photo in the Irish press. It was a very bad photo. <laughs> I dare say Brother Placid would take advantage of a bit of cheap advertising. Should you have told him? I wouldn't know. This is his sonny's writer who's just won the most prestigious literary prize in the country. Um, but, you know, you can see trouble coming down the track. And uh, that's the way that John's relationship with his father continued. His father lived until 1977, I think. And John always wished that he could have, have, a, have a happier relationship with the father. But that figure of the father, as you said, Colm, is there again and again, you know, right through uh, from beginning to end of his, of his career. Mm. Um, the question uh, arises now in writing, and it, it's a big one, of appropriation. For example, that you should not appropriate someone else's story, or that you should not, a man should not write a woman's point of view, and vice versa. And um, that you know, gay people write gay stories, straight people write straight stories, et cetera. Now, we have um, in Ireland in this period, for example, um, two extraordinarily intense books about um, women, being Brian Moore's Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn and John McGarren's The Barracks. And in which the interior life of a woman who's sort of out of place, who somehow or other either knows something more than everybody else, has that consciousness you've been describing, or else has her level of disappointment is so severe that she stands apart. And the male novelist simply, simply, you know, dramatizes this. And at in the same time, perhaps, as Edna O'Brien is dramatizing these wild young women in the country girls who are having a whale of a time, you know, um, in Dublin. So I just wonder if you could take us through what, what your, t I mean, what's your take on this idea of, of, of a young man in his 20s writing this story? Well, I think that the, the imagination has to be um, respected. And I think that uh, if a woman wishes to write from the point of view of a man, or a man from the point of view of a woman, I think that has to be permitted. I think that is the nature of fiction. Um, it's, it's sort of like, you know, when you're told sometimes, well, you know, well, you can't talk about Northern Ireland. You know, you're not from there. You can't talk about South Africa, or you can't talk about the war in Ukraine. You're not Ukrainian. But if we do that to ourselves, you know, where does it end? And the, the barracks, I mean, Elizabeth Regan is, is an heroic character. Uh, uh, and, and clearly what John McGarren has tried to do is, is he's tried, which must have been intensely painful, to get inside the mind of his dying mother, who was, the death of John's mother when he was nine was without doubt the most important moment in his life. Uh, and, and from that, from that loss, uh, you know, the, the pain that that creates and the attempt to understand that pain uh, all, all of his fiction can be explained from that moment. So I think it's a courageous thing that he tried to do, uh, to try to be, to get inside that woman's mind. And I think it's remarkable that this young man in his mid-twenties wrote this book. Um, 
I think it's tenderly done. I think it's respectfully done. Um, and I, I think it would be, and I, I, you're right, this, is, this has become a problem now for us. Um, can men write from the point of view of women? Can women write from the point of view of men? My students get very head up about these things in Liverpool. Um, but I, I say yes. I, you know, the, 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 imagine, the imagination has to be allowed to run riot. Can we, can we write Watership Down? Can we write from the point of view of rabbits? <laughs> yes, we can. Is Peter Rabbit an okay book? Is Squirrel Nutkin acceptable? Can a man write about a woman? Of course, yes, I think so. Yes. Um, there's a particular style this novel is written in, and it's hard to describe because it seems very plain. It seems that things are described in great plain detail. He, he loved those paintings by Velasquez, for example, the ones that were in Seville of ordinary people in a domestic place. The whole idea in this book, say, even of utensils in a kitchen, of flour, of light from a window, of the cat coming in, you know, all those small things that are happening in the light of domestic life. But the sentences, while seeming to be plain, also have a funny edge to them, as that, that, that there's a softening sound sometimes which moves closer to rhythm. So the sentences become sentences of rhythm as much as they are sentences of plain description. So you have a sort of tension going on. You're, you, some of you are not quite sure why you've just been so moved by an event in a paragraph that merely describes the way light falls or the way someone is going to bed at night and the, the sort of monotony described. But forget the monotony for a moment and just the thing, the object, the, the, the very thing, the shaving, the, the way he shaves in the morning, the alarm clock. Just take the alarm clock, the fact that she leans over him to turn it off until one morning she just can't do it. That alarm clock then has a very particular object in the room. And the way those objects are given a sort of, I suppose a sort of, um, a, a sort of glow comes from them, that, that each thing is described in that way. So um, I, I always thought of the, this novel as being that the prose style had been invented, uh, invented is not the word because there's nothing grand about this. It is that it seemed a natural style for his own voice in which he brought his own voice up a notch and began to work with that to find a sort of tone. But reading it this time, I found the following paragraph. And um, th th this, is, this, this, is, this is, again, um, her being in London. She couldn't recall much of the next few weeks. They became swallowed up in a merciful and protective fog. She saw Halliday, who's the doctor with whom she's having the relationship, almost every evening. She didn't know what had become of her if she couldn't see him. This terrifying need to see him took possession of her. She had to know that he was always available. She was helpless. She would be devoured by the need till she'd be able to find her own feet. Then she reacted to the lash of hurt vanity. And to recover herself out of the bondage of love, she was still in subjection to him, but she'd recover. She'd smash that subjection. She'd hate him. He was the cause of all her suffering. When she got completely free of him, she'd never see him again. She'd be mistress then. And she steeled herself to do without him, destroying the need within herself with the poison of hate and resentment. But in the meantime, she saw him constantly, his complete despair coming out in those evenings. He'd go to plays and concerts no more. The only place he could feel free was in pubs, and he was drinking heavily. And what I'm reading here is, is very unexpected. It's D.H. Lawrence. I can feel women in love. I can feel those, those, those novels about men and women in some sort of extraordinary battle with each other for dominance and for seeking freedom in a relationship and seeking freedom from a relationship. That The minute men and women get together, this friction begins in Lawrence. And I, I, he never mentioned Lawrence to me, mm. but you were telling me earlier that he, that, that he, that, yeah. that he did. Yeah, he liked Lawrence, especially Sons and Lovers. Um, and um, he, you know, what John read is a very interesting subject in and of itself. Um, one of the things I, I'd like to do as I carry on with the biography is John's library survives. And, um, you know, certain of the books he had are heavily annotated. Um, and it's interesting, for instance, that he reads... Uh, I think quite a lot more poetry than prose. Um, uh, but Lawrence, yeah, was, was one of the people that he admired. But the whole issue of, of sexual love is an obsession of McGarrett's uh, throughout. Um, 
And it, probably the best example of it is, is in the leave taking, which is in the first half of the novel is about the death of this man's mother and his memories of her, her funeral and not being permitted to go to the funeral, as John himself was not permitted to go to his mother's funeral by his father. Um, and how does one replace that first love? And then the second half of the leave taking is, is about him having a number of failed love affairs and then finding someone who, who, who he does fall in love with. So that battle between men and women, that attempt, he, he, there's something he loves that Proust says, where Proust says that um, uh, at, the, at the beginning of all carnal relationships are the seeds of calamity. Um, now, it's not that those seeds necessarily grow, but they're there. And uh, often they, it is calamitous. Um, if we're lucky, <laughs> we, might, we might manage one, one relationship where the calamity doesn't happen. But that calamity is very, very much to the fore of, of it's there in the barracks with her relationship with Halliday. I mean, that, that, that relationship is crucial, but it's calamitous also yeah. uh, you know, in her life. And she ends up settling for Regan. Um, but if you think of, if you go back and read all of McGahern, I would say, I would say that's his single greatest theme is that, is how we, how we engage with uh, romantic relationships, sexual relationships. How, how can we make them work? Isn't there another theme which is solitude, which is the lone figure, the lone Elizabeth here, the lone male figure, say, in the pornographer, and um, that, that I, you were talking earlier about the influences on him. I mean, I'm talking about Lawrence as being, say, at the time this book was written, D.H. Lawrence would have been all the rage, mm -hmm. but there was another rage which was coming from Paris, which was um, existentialism. Mm -hmm. so could you just talk about Oh, well, that? I mean, certainly, you know, the, and, I mean, another writer that John admired a great deal and was reading a lot at the time was particularly Albert Camus, and Camus' book, The Myth of Sisyphus, to me, is, is underlying the barracks frequently. So Elizabeth often steps outside of herself. So there's one scene, for instance, where she's cycling home from the town after she's seen the doctor. And she starts to think, you know, I am Elizabeth Regan. I am cycling up a hill. I'm cycling. I'm cycling up a hill. I'm cycling up a hill. And but, you know, Camus says that, you know, Sis Sisyphus is punished by the gods and he's made to push a rock up a hill for eternity, only for the rock to slide down again and again and again. And that is, the, the, you know, that the, the existentialists say, well, that's the human condition. But Camus says in, in that book that we must imagine Sisyphus happy. And I think that McGahern is, is trying to deal with that idea via the character of Elizabeth Regan. We're all, he says somewhere else, we're all in the same fix. I mean, which we are. I mean, the, the, book, the book is relentless in telling us this over and over. Um, so things like a holiday, a hell of loneliness between a dark birth and as dark a death, very Beckettian notions, or uh, the intolerable vacuum of their own lives, the cry of a fumbling loneliness, a shocking comedy. This is life. And um, uh, the exist, you know, what do we do with that? What do we do about that? And uh, you know, Camus was one of, one of those existentialists who felt that we can still live a good life despite our mortality and the absurdity of how, what we have to put up with. And I think that, you know, I, Ultimately, of course, it's sad that Elizabeth Regan has to go through this illness and die, but the very fact of her struggle with this, she isn't entirely hopeless. You know, her attempts to, under to go to the church, her attempts to pray, her thinking about the rosary, um, ultimately not getting sucker from that. But she's trying, you know, like Sisyphus, you know, that we all must try. And I think ultimately, for that, those reasons, for me, it's not, it's, it, it's, it's not a despairing novel. Um, in the mid-90s, there was a thing in France called L'Irlande Imaginaire, and they, they shipped vast numbers of Irish writers over to Paris. <laughs> and we were all selling our wares in various places to, to the, I must say, to the amusement of the French generally, but um, <laughs> except for John McGahan, 
And he was so famous at that time in France. Um, I think that to, to move from secondary school to university, to do that matriculation, we used to call it, you had to read one of his novels. But critics were really writing seriously about the, the, uh, the, uh, those ideas of life and death, the, 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 those ideas of seeking solace from religion and then seeking solace from something deep within the self. And then, so that while other Irish writers were reading on, from the platform, um, he was never doing that. Critics were talking about his work on the platform while he was sitting there. And was, he, he really was um, a very serious figure until there was a, a panel. Panels were always a disaster. And uh, someone started on and on rattling on about politics and the need for Irish writers to write about the North and to write about the economy and Charlie Yoy and oh, we should all be in politics. And he didn't say anything for ages. And then it just, you could see the teacher in him. You know, the teacher had just been annoyed by the pupils. You know? So he just simply said, the job of a writer is to look after his sentences. <laughs> Nothing else matters. And it really was a magisterial you know, distancing from the day to day. And a, a, you know, it's hard to argue with that, except that, that there is in this book, it, there is a, it is a version of the, um, not the Irish Free State. It feels like the Irish Free State, but I mean the early years of an emerging um, Republic or, or an emerging country, that, that, that there is a politics in the book. There is, yeah. Um, you know, it's a failing place um, a, or a disappointing place. And, you know, he follows that up very much in, in Amongst Women uh, with the character of Moran, uh, who is this thwarted ex IRA volunteer um, who. Um, feels that the country has been taken over by a new bourgeoisie of the priests and the doctors, especially. And they, the bourgeoisie get a bit of a kicking in, in uh, the barracks. Oh, the doctors? Yeah. Oh, you talk about going on these holidays yeah. to France, and we might sail down to Rome, just go, shut up, doctor. You know, yeah. Don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. no, it's, 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 uh, it's very unforgiving of that. And, and you'll find that again and again in McGarren. But the, there's a passage, if I can find it, where the... Uh, this is the, the sergeant, Sergeant Regan. All his people had farmed small holdings or gone to America, and if he had followed in their feet, he'd have spent his life with spade and shovel on the farm he had grown up on, or he'd have left it to his brother and gone out to an uncle in Boston. But he'd been born into a generation wild with ideals. They'd free Ireland. They'd be a nation once again. He was fighting with a flying column in the hills, when he was little more than a boy. He donned the uniform of the Garda Shia Khanna and swore to preserve the peace of the Irish Free State when it was declared in 1920, getting petty promotion immediately because he'd won officer's rank in the fighting. But there he stayed. This is exactly a description of John McGarren's father, Frank McGarren. This is what happened to him. He, he was in the IRA when he was a teenager. He, uh, he, had, he, he used to say, as Moran says in Amongst Women, he used to say at home, to the children that he was never happier than when he had a man in the sights of his rifle. Uh, that the only time he'd known true happiness was when he was at war. And the excitement of that. And in a way, not having to think. You know, just get out of the ambush and keep moving. But then he's deeply disappointed. He joins the Garda Shiakana, as, as many of the pro-treaty uh, IRA did. And he's in the first group to, to be trained. And he rises to the rank of sergeant very, very quickly served in lots of, of, of police stations in, in Donegal mainly, and then ultimately he, gets, he, he comes to Coote Hall. Um, but it's a very disappointing, he, he feels that the country he, he fought for hasn't been realized, and that you know, what, what the British once owned, the priests now own, and the doctors, yeah. and um, that it wasn't worth, wasn't worth the struggle. I want to ask you about, um, I think it was Dennis Sampson, the critic, who pointed out, if you just look at the opening, say, page and a half of, of the barracks, there's a titanic, massive battle going on between light and darkness. Almost every sentence has an image of some um, gleam of light or some glitter or some moment where the shadows come and the darkness falls. And, and it really, if you read it as, as, as a battle, as a massive battle, but you know, night falling and the people inside trying to keep some sort of light going from the fire, from the Sacred Heart lamp. Um, the, and the, in, in the very last page, as I mentioned, of Kukolo. And I just want to ask you finally, 
um, that idea that, that somewhere in the novel there is a sort of myth being played out about heroism and anti-heroism. Yeah, I mean, the, the mention of Coo struck me uh, as I was rereading it this time. The, uh, Regan was quiet, a sort of bitterness and contempt on the face that leaned towards the fire and the failing light. There's the light again. And then he stared into Mullins' face and said, it's always easy to make a Coo out of the other fella, isn't it, John? Um, I don't know what to make of that, other than that McGavern, as I said already, Yates was, was, was a huge, hugely important to him. And I know that he had, he had seen a production of The Death of Cuchulain in, in uh, Weston Row in 1959 when he was writing The Barracks. And Cuchulain, of course, fights this existential type of fight where he fights the waves. He fights, he beats the waves with his sword. And, you know, he's, he's gone mad, essentially. As Regan has kind of gone mad trying to best Quirk in this pointless, you know, bitter fight. Um, and, you know, uh, Elizabeth herself is, you know, is, is, is look, we're all, <laughs> we're all, Kukulin. you know, we're all fighting the waves and none of us are going to win. Um, but I think it happens again at the end of, 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 of Amongst Women when the, the faded tricolor is, is, is on the coffin of, of Morn mm -hmm. and uh, this old man appears from the crowd and he's described as something along the lines of from the time of Finn McCool. So it, there is some kind of mythical, archetypal thing going on in, in, in McGahan. Um, a few critics, uh, James Wise especially, has written very well about McGahan's interest in Carl Jung and the idea of a kind of race memory or a kind of collective unconscious that I do think is there also. Mm -hmm. um, but I shall have to give that one more thought. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Frank, it's really good of you to come and, and to talk to us about this book. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.